Hello guys and gals, me Mudahara. Today's video is brought to you by ExpressVPN. Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever played an online game with your IP address leaking all the time? I know I play a certain rock star of a title. And you know, every time you play online, sometimes you are exposing your actual personal information. Things that can possibly identify you. With ExpressVPN, you can log in, pick a whole range of servers from all over the world, and hide your IP address. Of course, Hiding your IP address and your traffic online should be a standard practice in today's day and age. And with ExpressVPN being in countries offshore, and with ExpressVPN having the ability to actually mask your data through RAM-based servers, not hard drive caches, no, 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 where after you're done with your sessions, they can just take the information out of caches, little shards of data. With RAM-based systems, you can just power off the electricity and bam, volatile memory is removed. Ladies and gentlemen, would I recommend it to you? Absolutely. This is one of the VPN services I use when I need to play certain video games online that still leak my IP address. Yes, even in 2022. Find out how you can get three months of ExpressVPN for free by visiting expressvpn.com SOG or clicking the link in the description box below. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, hopefully the passive aggressiveness has worn on to you. Check out expressvpn.com SOG to save three months. Let's get on with the video. Hello! How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Woohoo! What if I told you NVIDIA is not gonna like this video? NVIDIA might even want to remove this video, but I don't care because I'm off my medication, and now we're gonna talk about virtual machines and turning one of these graphic cards into 32. Now, uh, in the last week, uh, the RTX 4090 uh, finally dropped. And, uh, you know, I bet you've probably seen a bunch of channels benchmark and test the hell out of this graphic card. Graphics card, whatever, okay? At the end of the day, I'm going to give a quick review on it, okay? For around 3000 Canadian is what I paid for it. Uh, it's a good card. You know, it's a great card, okay? For the price of one month's rent, it's a pretty awesome graphics card. Now, a lot of people are like, what's the performance? Guys, I have only ever seen performance issues on Gotham Knights. Everything I throw at it, Red Dead Redemption 2, Call of Duty Warzone, you name it, it has not skipped a beat. Maximum frame rates at maximum fidelity, okay? Ray tracing, this shit chews right through it. DLSS, you know it works. Now, ladies and gentlemen, obviously for the price of this graphics card, I expect it to have good performance. When you buy a GPU that costs more than some computers, the PlayStation 5, the Xbox Series X, you expect it to do pretty well. Now, that shouldn't be a shocking thing to anybody. Obviously, one of the big things about this graphics card is the size. Now, one of the reasons I'm making this video is I kind of have to redo my entire virtual machine setup to begin with. Now, this is not Bisexual Billy, the computer, which has both the NVIDIA graphics card and the AMD graphics card. If you looked into it, I used to have an RTX 3090 and an AMD 6900 XT in the system. And what basically what I was doing was I was running my Linux system with the uh, uh, NVIDIA 3090, and I was running my virtual machine for uh, Windows, Mac, or Linux through the AMD card. Because of the size and thickness of the NVIDIA 4090, uh, yeah, I can only have one card in this case right now. Unless I open bench and do something really wacky, this is such a big card that it could possibly snap your entire PCI Express controller off if, if it felt like it. This is a heavy, bulky card, okay? When this thing is in your system, it's the only thing that wants to be in your system. Now, generally the card runs cool. I, I haven't had a heating issue with it. It's a fine graphics card. But what if I wanted to have my virtual machines and give them all the graphics card? Now, of course, when it comes to GPUs, when it comes to VMs, you can only necessarily have one VM per one actual graphics card. Because so far on this channel, we've been passing through a graphics card. So let me explain how this works in MS Paint terms, okay? Let's fire that. Let's fire it up and talk about it together, okay? Now inside this, uh, inside this little term over here, one thing I want to show you is, imagine if you had Virtual Machine 1, 
or sorry, this is your host, so I'm gonna I'm gonna give it A. Virtual Machine uh, Two and Virtual Machine, uh, sorry, Virtual Machine One and Virtual Machine Two. Now, what'll happen here is this is my host computer. These are virtual machines. So typically, if this is your CPU, all right, we're gonna call this CPU. You can feed your CPU and divvy it up with extensions across all of these virtual machines, okay? But when it comes to a GPU, which I'm gonna create right over here, GPU, you can only necessarily pass this to either the host or one of the virtual machines, okay? That's typically how it's always been. Today, we're going to get one graphics card and pass it to the host, pass it to another virtual machine, and if we felt like it, another virtual machine as well. This is something that's literally only reserved for NVIDIA's grid or NVIDIA's like enterprise solution. So if you actually wanted to do this, you would have to pay thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars for NVIDIA's highest end enterprise grade graphics cards, okay? And that's you also buying licenses, Windows licenses, you name it, okay? And some of these cards literally support certain versions or they don't, okay? Now, again, these are enterprise cards. Some of them come with 80 gigabytes of virtual memory which is important when you're doing things related to artificial intelligence and especially high compute scenarios. For us, we can actually have the same technology, but NVIDIA locks it down. So per NVIDIA statement, we wanted to update you on an error we made in answering your question on SRIOV, which is an implementation to partition a graphics card on GeForce, which is their consumer grade graphics cards. Okay, the stuff me and you are buying in the store. SRIOV is an enterprise feature and is not planned to be supported on GeForce products. So while there is definitely the hardware, NVIDIA will not support it via software because that cuts into their big money stream from the big enterprise companies out there. So what are we going to do? We're going to have capitalist on capitalist violence today because Microsoft of all companies is allowing us to do what NVIDIA don't. Now, to understand, being a Linux person myself, there's a couple ways to tackle this scenario, okay? To have one graphics card passed to, like, multiple systems. You could have something known as vGPU Unlock. I've talked about this before, and there's a great video on it from the friend of our channel, uh, Craft Computing, who's talked about this. But unfortunately, the problem that I have is with this system, you have to deal with having NVIDIA's like corporate systems, having access to their corporate cloud. Uh, you have to have, you have to basically have access to their vGPU software and their virtualization technology. So of course, I don't have access to it and I'm not going to go out of my way to get access to it. I'm sure there's a lot of legal red tape that I would be breaking if I chose to use it for gaming purposes or non, uh, I guess, corporate related material. There's another reason, there's another way you can do this called libvf.io. I was going to use this for my Linux system, but unfortunately, it seems as though looking into their support matrix, it doesn't actually support the NVIDIA graphics technology I want to use, okay? So for instance, the NVIDIA 40 series does not seem to be supported. In fact, if anything, the 30 series RTX, the Ampere series, does not seem to be properly supported in some cases too. Okay, so we're a few minutes into this. All right, I might have to cut down the beginning for brevity, but let's get into this, okay? How do you split up this graphic card or really most graphics cards so you can actually have virtual machines and hosts and share the performance between them? So, okay, let's get started. First things first, we need to have Hyper-V and get that enabled onto Windows, okay? Now, Hyper-V is a component for Windows 10 Professional or Windows 11 Pro. So from my understanding, you need to have the Pro versions of Windows 11 or 10 to get this running. The other big caveat is when you are virtualizing and your guest virtual machine needs to run, that needs to be matched to your host operating system. So if you're using Windows 10 Pro, make sure your virtual machine is Windows 10 Pro. I'm using Windows 11, the newest right there, just to make it super easy for everyone to get into. So again, what we're going to be doing is we're going to go to start and type in Windows Features, okay? This is going to, be, this is going to take you to turn Windows Features on or off. So click on that and it opens up this window. Now here you want to find Hyper-V and enable it. I've already done it. You're going to click on these, download whatever Windows wants you to do, and restart your system. What this will do is virtualize your Windows 11 system underneath Hyper-V. At this point, you are running Hyper-V, okay, as your, you know, um, what is it, your hypervisor, and underneath it is Windows 11, okay? Now normally you shouldn't notice any difference from using Windows 11, but you are actually virtualizing your operating system now. So once you've done that, you want to open up and click on the Hyper-V Manager, okay? So here, you're going to be doing a couple things. Now, yours will not look like my screen. You might have to, uh, you know, 
create a new server, it's a pretty automated process. You might have to name it, but eventually under the Hyper-V manager will be your local virtualization server. So here's where you're gonna do a couple things. First things first, you're gonna go to actions. You're gonna go to virtual switch manager. And in virtual switch manager, you're going to create a new network switch. You're gonna make sure it's an external switch. You're gonna hit okay. And once you open up an external switch, actually have we done it, virtual switch manager, new virtual switch, sorry. You're gonna to go to external, you're gonna create new virtual switch. And inside here, you're going to pick whatever your network controller is. For me, I'm going with my Wi-Fi controller because I'm still moving and I only have my Wi-Fi working. So click on that. And if that's your only thing, you wanna make sure you do allow management operating system to share the network adapter. You can then name it to whatever you want. I just call it external access for easy, you know, understanding. So of course, now that that's done and you have it ready and available, it's time to hit okay. So over here, you wanna do file or, or sorry, right click here and do new and virtual machine. So now we're gonna make a brand new virtual machine to actually install Windows 2. And then we're gonna to get to the meaty stuff. So to get this going first, you need a copy of Windows 11's ISO file. And in order to do this, it's as simple as opening up Google, all right, typing in Windows 11 ISO. And it should typically be the first uh, link. It should be like an official Microsoft link. Go over there, go to download Windows 11 disk image, select the download, multi-edition ISO, hit download. And then you wanna make sure that you choose whatever your language is. I'm gonna go with English, United States, hit yes. And of course, in this case, it's going to be validating and just download the 64-bit ISO file, okay? It'll take you a few minutes depending on your internet connectivity, but once that's done, store it somewhere because you're gonna need that to install. So now you're gonna right click, you're gonna hit new, virtual machine, and you're gonna go through this uh, wizard. So I'm gonna guide you through what you need to do exactly. So first things first, click next, and then you're gonna name it. So in this case, we're gonna name it test, right? And once you've done it, uh, you want to choose generation two. Now, between these generations, generation one supports 32-bit, but generation two gives you more features, and this is where we're going to be using to split the graphic card or partition it. So generation two, very important. You can only do that when you're making a virtual machine. You can't edit this later on. Once you hit next, give it some memory. I have 128 gigabytes, but I'm just going to give it 16,000. Give whatever is appropriate for your system here, okay? You wanna make sure you also don't use dynamic memory. Very important you don't do that. Go to next. And inside here, when it comes to networking, make sure you do external access, which is the network switch we just made. Once you go next, give it some hard drive space. I typically give it 250 gigabytes. That's a pretty healthy, good kosher amount. You can give it more, you can give it less. This will not use your hard drive space immediately. So if you have 250 gigabytes, it'll use up to whatever it needs, okay? So again, hit next. And then you wanna do install an operating system from a bootable image file. Where you just downloaded your Windows 11 ISO file, you wanna make sure you link right there and then hit next. And once that's all done and good, before you launch it, we're gonna be doing a couple things here. So right click your new virtual machine, go to settings, and inside your settings, you wanna change just a few things. For instance, in checkpoint, you wanna completely disable that there. This is something that's very important. Disable it right here and forget about it. Because we're also installing Windows 11, go to where it says security and enable trusted platform module. You're gonna need this, otherwise Windows 11 won't install. There's a TPM requirement and you wanna make sure that that's there. And when it comes to your processors, I have 32 threads, so I'm gonna split it up and give it 16. Again, give whatever you feel is appropriate, except the number one, okay? You don't wanna give it just one thread, otherwise you're gonna have a bad goddamn time. And once that's all good and done, you can hit okay and just leave it right there. The other important thing is to go to right-clicking your actual server here. So right-click where it has your overlord, yours might be different, mine is overlord because I called it that. Go to Hyper-V settings, and inside Hyper-V settings, you want to go to enhanced session mode, and if this is enabled, you want to disable this. That is very important, okay? You wanna make sure that's completely gone. Otherwise, that's not going to allow you to split up your graphics card. So once that's all good and done, double click on this, and then you wanna start it up, and then you wanna go through the process of installing Windows. Again, it's just like you would regularly do it, go through that, and then we'll come right back to splitting up this graphics card. Now, in this case, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna open up on our host system, our main Windows installation, we're gonna open up PowerShell, and you're gonna run that as administrator. 
So once you run PowerShell here, what you want to do is you want to type in the words get dash VM host partition and partitionable, sorry, partitionable GPU. Sorry, I'm looking at my notes. And once you would enter on that one, let's just uh, open that up a little bit, zoom in. You'll start to see that if you get this prompt, that means you have a partitionable GPU. My 4090 is very partitionable as you've seen. Now you're gonna basically save this somewhere in a notepad file and you're gonna basically store all this information. All of this, very important to keep with you, okay? Now, if you look at this number over here, 32, this gives us up to 32 partitions to virtualize this GPU. So we can go up to like 31, I believe, and create 31 VMs and keep passing this GPU. Obviously, the performance is not gonna be there. If you launch 31 instances of Red Dead Redemption 2 across virtual GPUs, your performance will tank completely. This is really viable if you wanna split a game that's something like Borderlands or something even like Warzone if you've got the hardware enough to split it between two actual systems, sometimes three, maybe four, up to you. So again, just copy all this down. The important things are these numbers where it relates to total VRAM, available RAM, optimal partition VRAM, and total encode, available encode, you know it. So again, just save it and keep it away somewhere because we're gonna need that very quickly. All right, so first off, we're going to copy the drivers from our host system to our virtual machine. We need these so we can actually partition the GPU. Now, in this case, you want to make sure your actual graphics card right now is completely updated. So again, if you have an NVIDIA card, GeForce Experience, go to Drivers, check it for an update. And since I have the latest update as of now, we're going to just start copying files. Okay, so now we have to copy the drivers from our actual host system to our guest system. Now, you're going to want to be doing this every time you update your actual uh, GPU drivers. You need to make sure this is consistent, otherwise this will not work. So on our desktop, I made a folder known as send to VM. We're going to just copy the files into this folder before we copy it into our virtual machine. So again, what we're going to do over here is we're going to open up a Windows Explorer. We're going to go all the way down here. We're going to go to our C drive. We're going to go to Windows. Uh, we're going to go to System32. So it should be somewhere in here. So right here, System32. And then we're going to go to Driver Store. Okay, so in Driver Store, we're going to go to File Repository. And we're going to be finding the NVIDIA file, okay? We're going to be finding our NVIDIA drivers. So again, type in N until you get to something known as NV, okay? So keep going at it, keep going at it, keep going through it. And eventually, inside all these folders should be NV. Right now, we're at NE. Yes, here we go. NV, okay? So now we're at NV. So what's important here is NV underscore dispy dot INF underscore AMD64. You want to make sure you have this folder and we're going to just copy that. So we're going to just copy it right here as a whole into our send to VM folder. So just paste that there. And then beyond this, we're also going to be copying a bunch of files in the system 32 folder itself. System 32. Okay. And we're going to go into that and inside our actual host system 32 folder, we're going to just do N to get to NV real quick. So just keep on going down until you get to where it goes to the NV files. All right. So here it is, we're at NV, okay? So and after NTVDM, we're at NV agent. So again, you wanna just scroll down carefully and just copy everything up until NVSP info, okay? So you see how it changes to OBJ SEL? We're gonna take all of these files, we're gonna copy them, and we're gonna post them in our send to VM folder, okay? Like so. We're gonna need these files and we're gonna need these so we can copy them into our guest virtual machine and actually get these drivers where they're supposed to be. So now that we've done that, shut down your guest virtual machine and we're going to be copying the files over. Now there's a couple ways to do this, but I'm gonna show you the super easy one right now. Inside our actual Hyper-V manager where I have this test, we're gonna right click this, okay, like so. And we're actually, or sorry, we're just gonna click on this, or we don't really have to click on this. In the right in Overlord, or like where your server settings are, you wanna go to inspect disk, okay? It'll open up this folder, or this, uh, this window. Now, because I labeled it as test, you'll see this folder, hard, dry, hard disk image file. Right click test, and just hit mount, okay? And once you've mounted it, it'll open up a new window underneath drive E, okay? This is my actual guest virtual machine drive. All we have to do 
inside the host here is just copy send to VM. Actually, no, one thing we can do just to make it super duper simple is actually right click this folder on your desktop, your sent to VM, and just uh, compress it real quick, okay? So actually just go into it and send it to a zipped folder, just so there's no mismatching or anything. All right, so once that folder has been made, you're gonna just copy that into your local disk like so, okay? It'll ask you, you need administrator permission, just granted that and it'll copy the file over. And once that is done, all you want to do is go back and just eject it from your system. Once that's done and it has been ejected, it's time for you to spin up your virtual machine once more. So hit start and let's get to the next phase. This is where we're going to be copying this to specific parts of our virtual machine so we can actually have these ready to launch, okay? So go into our system, fire it up. It should take a few seconds depending on where you stored it. Open up your file manager, go to your drive, hit C, and you should see this folder that we just copied, sent to VM. So open that up real quick inside here. And what you want to do is you want to copy these to very specific locations. So for instance, you want to open up another little uh, window and go to, go to your C drive, go to Windows, and then you want to go all the way to your System32 drive inside your virtual machine. So we're going to find it real quick, uh, System32. And inside System32, we want to create host driver store. You, you won't have this folder, okay? This will not be present. So right click anywhere, go to new and click folder. You're gonna need admin privileges. So again, provided as so. And you're gonna do host driver store. So yes, go into it and then right click again, hit new, hit folder. Again, one more. And inside here, you're gonna type in file uh, repository. Again, this needs to be very case sensitive. So repository as so. Hit yes, make sure all the spelling makes sense. So uh, repository, yeah. So once that's good, open up that folder and copy an nvdisp into that folder, okay, as so. So continue, let it do its thing. Okay, so once that's pretty much done copying over, you wanna go back into your send to VM thing and where we have like system32 as a folder, click on that and all these files, you're gonna just control all, control C, and you're gonna go to your guest uh, system32 folder and you're just gonna paste it all in here, okay? So continue posting it and just give it all the permissions. And once it's posted, once it's like there, all you wanna do is then shut down your virtual machine. So again, go over here, shut it down. And now we wanna just launch one script to make this all super gravy and super kosher. So as your virtual machine is shut down, you wanna open up your host system. Now in your host system, you're gonna do PowerShell ISE, okay? Run that as administrator, hit yes. And let's get to writing a quick script. Now, given that we named this virtual machine test, that's gonna be very important. Now you could just put these commands in, but we're gonna write a script just so you can actually do this every time you update your GPU drivers as well too, because I believe you need to do that. So again, in this script, we're gonna just type it like so, okay? We're gonna start off line one, we're gonna do $VM equal uh, colon test, okay? Or just apostrophe test, we're gonna do that. We're gonna go and put two more lines in. So line three, we're gonna do add dash VM, uh, GPU partition adapter. If it hi auto highlights as one, just hit enter and go on. Dash VM name, okay, like so. And it has to be like exactly capital. So again, dash VM and capital N A M E. And then you want to do dollar VM, okay? And make one more line. Do set VM GPU partition adapter, okay? Dash VM name. And then, of course, $VM, okay? Now here, we're going to do a couple things. We're going to do min partition VRAM. And we're going to do 8000000, okay? That, I believe, is like one of the ranges that we have to add. Then, you're going to do max partition VRAM. And you're, in this case, we're going to refer to the numbers that we copied earlier, okay? So I'm just gonna enter it all in as I have, all right? I'm gonna copy paste exactly what I have here, all right, into this. And of course, if you look at my script real carefully, you can see that I have had the min partition VRAM, max partition, optimal partition, min partition encode, max partition encode, optimal partition encode, min partition decode, 
max partition decode, optimal partition decode, min partition encode, max partition encode, optimal partition encode, min partition decode, max partition decode, optimal partition decode, min partition compute, max partition compute, optimal partition compute. I've used all of these. And uh, the reason I'm doing it just to make everything super duper granular and make it all work. Now you're gonna make two more lines go to line six, and these are the real important things that I've seen uh, from other people that have done this, okay, from all the GitHub. So you're gonna do set dash VM space dash guest control cache types, and then you're gonna do dollar true, okay, dash VM N, uh, and then just name, right, as we've seen here, and dollar VM, okay? So exactly how we've done it there. Now you're gonna do another set VM uh, and you're gonna make sure it's as low memory mapped IO space. Now in this case, it's one GB that I've seen and then dash VM and name. And then of course, dollar VM. And then of course you wanna do set VM and you wanna do high memory mapped IO space. In this case, you're gonna do 32 gigabytes, all right? Now you're gonna do dash VM and name, all right? dollar vm okay and once that's done we're going to save this script and we're just going to save it somewhere on our desktop we'll put it in the send to vm folder we're going to call this uh vm partition all right or whatever you want to call it hit save and once that is done ladies and gentlemen we want to make sure that we can even launch these to begin with so first things first we're going to go to set in this little blue box set execution policy and you're gonna do unrestricted, okay? And just hit enter and hit yes to all. And once you're done here, you see that big green play button, hit it, run the script. And once that's good, you've got it, all right? It's done, all right? One, it's literally that easy. So now that we've all done it, we're gonna open up our test virtual machine and we're gonna hit start here, okay? And hopefully if all things considered, our virtual machine should be passing through our GPU just fine. So here it is, it's firing up my actual virtual machine. And if I right click Windows, and if I go to Device Manager, you'll notice in Display Drivers, I've got an NVIDIA RTX 4090, ladies and gentlemen, and it is working properly, which means you can actually split your graphic card between your host system and all the little sub virtual machines that you've got, all right? This is not something NVIDIA wants you to do. This goes right against their data, but this goes against their corporate plans, but we don't care because we're gamers. We paid an arm and a leg. You bet I'm going to use the features I've been, I, I, I have on this card. Get out of here. So exactly how does this work? All right, so here I've got another virtual machine. I'm just going to shut down this one that I have. I'm going to fire up another virtual machine. And in this case, you have to install a couple new programs too, okay? So for instance, you need VB cable to make sure you can get audio funneling back to your system. You want to make sure you install a dummy HDMI uh, uh, monitor because basically this relies on you having uh, your actual... Um, Hyper-V window open. I mean, you could just use it like this, but this is not gonna give you good frame rates. You also wanna make sure you install software like Parsec, okay? So you can actually run games at 60 frames. So in this case, to show you how this works is, in here, I have Steam installed, I have some benchmarks, but I'm gonna show you what gaming is like for a second, okay? So we're gonna fire up Resident Evil 2, okay? Now in Resident Evil 2's case, we're gonna fire this up, the game launches in the virtual machine without any issues, okay? So here it is, the game is going, it's giving me a health warning. I'm gonna hit yes, I'm gonna hit okay. And to show you just how good this is running, once I hit start over here, once I go to options, once I go to the uh, graphic settings, you can see that I have it running at 1080p. And of course with Parsec, I could have this running at super ultra wide if I wanted to. And of course I have ray tracing enabled. So we're getting the full memory of my GPU, all the ray tracing features, everything maxed out. Now inside over here, I'm gonna hit story mode. I'm gonna load up a game file. So I guess somewhere in like 14, like level 14 is fine. Now what you're gonna notice is like a bit of a laggy, like uh, you're gonna notice that obviously it's it's not super smooth underneath the Hyper-V window. But if you look at the top right, the frame rate graph or the frame rate display should say 60, okay? So in this case, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna launch something known as Parsec on my home computer. So as I launch Parsec, I've already installed it onto the guest system. I'm just gonna connect to it. 
and it's going to launch in and it's here it is my resident evil save so here i can just close out my hyper v window and just play the game underneath uh parsec so to speak so again you can see in parsec i'm actually playing the game and i'm playing resident evil with all the bells and whistles and graphics that a growing boy would come to expect from any of their favorite games okay the game is running with all the benefits that you would expect out of anything nvidia related so what I'm going to do now is I'm actually going to go all the way up and I'm going to leave this game running so we can actually see uh, the game also running alongside another piece of software on my host. So again, I'm just going to leave it up over here. This is the game ray tracing and doing all of its do's and dads as it's running in the corner. So again, I'm going to put this window up over here. All right. As you see right there. Okay. And of course, within my actual uh, Hyper-V window, I'm just going to leave this minimized. Okay. Okay, so the game is running in the corner over there just fine. Now, what if I wanted to also play a game on my main system? Well, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch a game on my actual host virtual machine. Okay, not my host virtual machine, my host system entirely. So again, we're going to go open up Steam here real quick. So like so, go to our library. And inside our library, we're going to find another game. All right, preferably one, maybe even with ray tracing. I don't know. Uh, in this case, I'm going to launch uh, Spider-Man Remastered, okay? We're going to hit play on this. We're going to launch it. Oh, wait. You are logged into another computer. Okay, we're going to launch something else underneath a different launcher, okay? So again, for the sake of GTA sake, I'm just going to run this at 1080p so it looks a little, you know, easy on the eyes for everyone watching. And GTA 6, or sorry, GTA, GTA 5 is launching while Resident Evil is processing on the GPU in this corner over here, okay? So it's a rock solid 60 frames per second. So as GTA is gonna launch, we're gonna load into the story mode. Now, typically when you run a 3D application on your host system, this will actually steal frames away from all the virtual machines. Hyper-V makes it so that the actual uh, host gets priority on the access to the graphics card, okay? But as you can see over here, I'm running GTA 5, obviously just fine. This is 60 frames. It is running absolutely well, all right? This is about as well as you can expect when your graphic card is being split between two big instances. So this is running a full GTA instance while it's also running Resident Evil 2, fully maxed out with ray tracing and everything over there. Now, what is the big benefit of this? For instance, being that this is a beefy system, I can actually put a thin client in the corner of my system and just run two gaming systems off of one box. Now that I can virtualize a 32 threaded processor and a 4090 graphics card in between two systems. And of course, if I actually feel my GPU, it's not getting hot or anything. This is about as much, you, it's actually just splitting the card appropriately under the hypervisor. And of course, as I'm playing GTA, I can switch all over here to, you know, uh, Resident Evil 2 and play that as so. Now, of course, as soon as I turn off Resident Evil 2, so if I quit the game and just quit it right here, uh, just go all the way back in, GTA will run even smoother because I'm killing all forms of allocation to uh, the graphics card. So once it's on the desktop over here, GTA will run visibly smoother. It may stutter less too. So again, this is a totally cool thing that you can do, splitting up one graphics card between multiple virtual machines. Now you might be wondering, but Muda, what's the ultimate point of all this? Why would you go through this much effort? And the reality of it is, is I go through this much effort simply because I care a lot about my system security and I care a lot about me just having all of my software separated properly. See, in a day and age where the software we run and the anti-cheats we allow ourselves to run are so, I guess you could say, uh, deep rooted into our systems, I always virtualize all of these games like Call of Duty Warzone, Apex Legends, games with these heavy anti-cheats into these virtualized platforms so they can have their own separate section that nobody's peeking into and they also can't peek into my personal information. Same thing with any form of software or web browsing, so to speak. Virtualization and containerizing and sandboxing is great. Xbox One as a gaming platform does it and plenty of other platforms should be doing it. Honestly, if NVIDIA allowed us access to this kind of technology as a mainstream, we could have far safer gaming systems and far more better anti-cheat uh, consolations across the board. I would be totally okay with an anti-cheat 
having access to its own virtualized virtualized platform that I can't peek into and vice versa and living totally fine. That way I can keep my data preserved and private and the game can be untouched like it should, free from cheaters, so to speak. Obviously, it's a bit more complicated than that, but yeah, that's generally one of my beliefs. Now, of course, ladies and gentlemen, this is not a perfect method for me. Being a Linux user, I could never fathom running Windows natively, so for me, I'm going to be looking into other options. But I wanted to cover this one because for the first time, this is something that NVIDIA or AMD or Intel would never allow. This is big money for them. And for now, for now, we have access to it completely for free. Again, that could change. Microsoft could change this at any given moment, but so far it's been like this for a year. Ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you saw, please like, comment, and subscribe. Dislike if you dislike it. I am.